So uh, we were kind of towards the end of solutions, I think, uh, when we kind of left there, uh, chapter nine. Uh, so just a couple of reminders of some of the stuff that we've already sort of covered, I think, in this chapter. Uh, first off, obviously, solutions, as we talked about a number of times last time, uh, is basically made up of two parts. Again, we have our solute, uh, which is the smaller part of the solution. And we have our solvent, uh, which is the larger part of the solution. And again, uh, that's really what a solution is, is a homogeneous mixture. Uh, solutions are those guys that really do get that aqueous sort of symbol next to them. And a homogeneous mixture means really everything mixes together, right? So uh, typically to make a solution, we take something, you know, a lot of times that's a solid, for example, uh, like say sodium chloride, and we put it in something like water, which is a very good solvent for a lot of things. And obviously something like sodium chloride will dissolve in the water and that will make a solution that is a sodium chloride solution. Uh, remember that when you sort of uh, see a formula with the aqueous symbol, which is a solution, the name of the solution is really the solute. So if you have a sodium chloride solution, it is sodium chloride. That was the solute that was dissolved. If you have a hydrochloric acid solution, then hydrochloric acid or hydrogen chloride is really the solute that was dissolved uh, in that. Uh, we talked about the idea of sort of solubility as well, I think, in this chapter. And, uh, you know, um, the reason why certain things will sort of dissolve in each other or be soluble in each other uh, it has a lot to do with sort of the interactions that occur uh, between, say, a solute and a solvent. Uh, if things are using very similar, uh, what I refer to as intermolecular forces, and those are really the forces of how a molecule basically interacts with another molecule, be it a, another molecule that's the same as it, or another molecule that is different. And if they basically are going to interact using the same sort of properties, if you will, or ways, uh, they typically will be soluble in each other. If they're using really two very different sort of ways to interact, they're usually not going to be very soluble in each other. Uh, they'll be insoluble in each other. So for example, the, as we just did there, the sodium chloride plus the water, water and sodium chloride can sort of interact with each other through uh, what's known as sort of dipole-dipole interaction or ion-dipole interaction. It's a basic interaction of like positive and negative attraction to each other. So it works really well as water is a polar molecule. So there's like a negative side of the water, uh, which is the oxygen part. And there's a positive side of the water, which is the hydrogen part. Uh, so it's able to interact with ions that have positive and negative charges as you know, opposites attract each other. So they interact really well. And you know, that's different than if you took something like oil, which is basically carbons and hydrogens. And that's basically long chains of carbons and hydrogens. And uh, carbon and hydrogen and carbon carbon bonds, which is what you typically find in oil, those are nonpolar bonds. So when they try to interact with something like water, which is a polar molecule, water is really looking to do like a positive negative interaction. Uh, oil, you know, needs a lot of help to get sort of that interaction going. And they really don't have a long way, a way of interacting with one another uh, because of that. Uh, and that's really because something like oil uses what is known as dispersion forces, which is basically temporary type forces that occur. They're not really permanent type of things that occur. Well, something like water, you know, again, we'll use something really which is known as hydrogen bonding, um, which is basically that positive negative attraction that involves the hydrogen. So we talked about an idea when we talk about solubility of, of something that's oftentimes referred to as like dissolves like. And what that really means is, again, if you've got something that's ionic and polar, they're all good in each other. They'll be very soluble in one another. If you have two things that are typically polar, they also will be really soluble in each other because, again, they both are going to be using the same type of interaction with each other. And the one that sometimes people miss out on is the idea that if you have something that is nonpolar with something that is nonpolar, they actually will be very soluble in each other because again, they're using the same type of interactions that they use with themselves. So they're able to interact the same way. So all these sort of combinations does lead to things being soluble in each other. Uh, 
Uh, again, the main place where you run into trouble is when you sort of cross over and you take something that is polar with something that is nonpolar. Again, that's really our oil and water example here. They don't have that long way, way of keeping that interaction going. I mean, think we maybe even talked about any kind of like oil and vinegar salad dressing, right? You can mix it for a bit, it'll stay mixed for a bit, but eventually everybody's gonna separate out because again, they cannot really hold on to that interaction over a long period of time. So things sort of separate out because of that. Uh, and these guys typically will be insoluble here uh, with each other. Any questions on that aspect of the stuff we talked about here? <clears throat> I think we might also saw some solubility rules, I think in this chapter, if I'm not mistaken, as to, you know, when you put two ionic things together, would you expect something to make a solid or not? Uh, then we sort of talked about different types of concentration units, right? And we talked about uh, some percent concentration units like uh, percent mass to mass, which is the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution times 100%. Remember that when you're using this one, it is the bottom part that is really important. A lot of times in these problems, they will give you the mass of the solute and the solvent sort of separate from one another. So you've got to usually a lot of times kind of add those together to make sure you are getting the mass of the actual solution and not just using the mass of the solvent. Uh, then we also saw, I think, uh, percent volume to volume, and that is the volume of a solute over the volume of a solution times 100%. Uh, this is typically like milliliters over milliliters. And we also saw percent uh, mass to volume, which is our mass of our solute divided by the volume of solution times 100%. So these are three sort of common percent concentrations that we talked about. We also talked about the idea that, you know, if you're sort of given one of these sort of percent concentrations, you can sort of very easily turn it into like a conversion factor. You could almost do these problems more like a dimensional analysis kind of conversion type of aspect. So if we had a 3.75% by mass calcium chloride solution, we could just assume 100. Again, it keeps all the numbers the same. And that basically means that we would have 3.75 grams of calcium chloride and 100 grams of solution. And we could use it as a conversion factor such as that. We could also obviously flip it around and put the 100 grams of solution up on top and the 3.75 grams of calcium chloride there on the bottom. And again, you could kind of approach the problem more as a, a, a dimensional analysis approach. We also talked about, you could also just plug and chug into these equations and it should come out obviously the same as long as you rearrange it correctly. You could obviously do that for any of these percent concentrations. Uh, if this was the 3.75% by volume calcium chloride, what that would mean is you would have 3.75 milliliters of calcium chloride and 100 milliliters of solution. So again, it works basically the same uh, for any of those sort of percent concentrations. Again, really the only one here that you usually have to really worry about in terms of that bottom part is the mass of the solution. Again, when you're given the volume, usually it's the actual volume of the solution. It's not usually separated in terms of volumes, but just the mass part. Any questions on those there? <clears throat> we then, I think, sort of finished up with uh, one of the uh, most common units of concentration, uh, which is molarity, right? And molarity is uh, big M. And molarity is uh, moles of solute per liter of solution. Or most people just go molarity is moles per liter. And you could kind of think of that as like a formula because in a lot of cases, uh, we can solve for any one of those three things depending on sort of the information given to us. If we wanted liters, it would be moles divided by molarity. And if we wanted moles, which is a very common thing you've done is liters times molarity. So those are sort of a couple of ways that we very commonly rearrange this equation to use uh, to solve for any of those things. Whenever you're using sort of molarity and volume alone in this sort of uh, context, 
the volume always has to be in liters. So a lot of the times uh, the volume is given to you in milliliters. So that kind of liters to milliliters conversion is something that you do a lot when you're kind of dealing with this, especially when you're trying to find moles uh, using volume and molarity. You don't really want to times uh, milliliters times the molarity uh, in this particular application because you won't really get moles. You'll get what's known as millimoles, which is a little bit different. Uh, so it's always a good idea to convert it to liters when you're using it with obviously molarity. And obviously it does need to be in liters if you're just going to plug it into that formula as well. Now we talked about sort of the molarity and sort of how it relates to ions. So sometimes, you know, if we are looking at just the ion part of an ionic compound uh, rather than uh, the whole thing, there is sort of a relationship. So for example, if we have calcium chloride, uh, that is a solution. Really in the solution, there are no units of calcium chloride still together. It will really 100% break apart into calcium ions that are floating around in the beaker or wherever you got the solution. And you'll have a couple of chloride ions basically floating around. So sometimes we may be interested in just the calcium ions in the solution or just the chloride ions in the solution. And sometimes we want to kind of figure out what the molarity of each of those ions are by themselves. And sort of the quick way to do it is very much like sort of stoichiometry. Uh, so for example, if this was one molar uh, calcium chloride, we could just do sort of a stoichiometry relationship of how it breaks apart. It breaks apart into one of the whole things to one of the calcium ions. And how that relates to the concentration is typically you would just take one times the molarity here which means in that particular solution, the concentration of the calcium ions that are floating around is one molar as well. But we see sort of a different relationship when we look at the chloride ions that go into that solution. For every one of the whole guy, we actually get two chloride ions per one unit. So you can think about it as basically like twice as concentrated as in chloride ions floating around as calcium. So how that really affects the concentration is you actually take two times uh, the concentration there, and it would actually be two molar chloride ions. Again, uh, concentration is not additive. So obviously if you add two and one, you don't get two, uh, but it's sort of a proportion of, you get twice as much chloride ions floating around as you do calcium. So the concentration of chloride ions are twice as much. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> In addition, uh, we talked about a couple other things like electrolytes. Uh, remember, strong electrolytes 100% uh, break apart. They produce a lot of ions, which means they conduct electricity really, really well. So again, the light bulb example goes off really, really bright. There's also weak electrolytes, which mainly stay together. but it does produce a few ions. So because it's able to produce a few ions, it will still be able to conduct electricity, but obviously nowhere near sort of how a strong electrolyte would do it. Uh, so again, in that light bulb example, kind of a dim light bulb will kind of go off there. And uh, there's also non-electrolytes, uh, which will dissolve in solution, but produce no ions. And it's really the lack of ions being there as to why they are not able to really conduct electricity. And so it is the presence of those ions in the solution floating around, which uh, gives us sort of that ability to conduct electricity. A couple of ways you can recognize each of these three, as we talked about, is uh, strong electrolytes, basically a one-way arrow where everything dumps out to the product side in terms of ions. Weak electrolytes typically have arrows heading in both directions again, going back and forth. And non-electrolytes will typically have a one-way arrow where on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, pretty much the same thing as the arrows just would dissolve on the right-hand side as versus solid like sugar, I think was the example we uh, talked about in here. Any questions on those electrolytes there? And the other thing I think we also talked about was uh, equivalents, right? And equivalents or milliequivalents is related to the charge. So if we had something like sulfate, 
that minus two charge is really the number here, would tell us that in one mole of sulfate, uh, we had two equivalents. Remember, it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. Uh, the sort of positive or negative of the charge is not really of importance here, but it's actually just the number. And uh, again, a lot of times we could use it as a conversion factor as things like IV bags and so forth, again, are sometimes given in terms of equivalents per liter or milli equivalents per liter. Um, again, because they have a lot of ions floating around uh, in those sort of things. Any questions on any of that stuff? I think I caught everything there, I think. All right, so uh, where we are at at this point is, uh, I believe, the next sort of aspect is talking about dilutions. So we talked about the idea that a lot of solutions will uh, basically come as what they're sometimes referred to as stock solutions or really concentrated solutions. So for example, they will have a, a high molarity uh, value. So if something has a uh, kind of large molarity value, like 18 molar or something like that, that is a very strong sort of a solution. It has a lot of solute dissolved in it. A lot of times we don't need to use solutions that are that strong. So a lot of times what we end up using, say in the lab and stuff like that are dilute solutions. And a dilute solution or doing a dilution usually involves pretty much adding more solvent. A lot of times people say adding more water, but again, a reminder that water is a very common solvent for a lot of things, uh, but it's not 100% the right solvent for everything. So really when you do a dilution, you're adding more solvent, but some, a lot of times we talk about it in terms of adding more water. Um, and the reason that basically does a dilution is it will bring down the concentration or molarity. So if we look at really what molarity is, as we just saw, it is the moles of solute per liter of solution. So when we add something like more water to a solution, what we're essentially doing is increasing the bottom part here. And when we increase the bottom number, if you just think about it mathematically, if the bottom number gets larger and you divide the top number by a larger number, you end up with a smaller number. So by basically building up more solvent, we're increasing the volume of the solution. And just mathematically speaking, we will end up dividing by a larger number and that will bring the molarity down. So that typically will bring that molarity down because of that. The one thing that actually doesn't change during a dilution is the moles of solute. So when we talk about things reacting, for example, it really is, and especially in a solution, it is the, really the solute, the moles of solute that is there. That's really what's reacting when you do it. It's not really the solvent. Uh, so the moles of the solute before and after the dilution basically remains the same. It doesn't change, but the molarity will always change as you change volume. So Molarity concentration is tied to the volume. So as that volume changes, the molarity constantly changes. There's certain processes that you do in chemistry sometimes where you're just constantly adding volume. And that means that you're constantly changing the molarity. But in those situations, what we often do is actually follow not the molarity, but we'll follow the moles of the solute because that again remains relatively constant as this process uh, goes through. So there is actually a dilution equation that we uh, kind of use, and this is a very fancy way that we make a dilution. This is again, a volumetric uh, flask. Volumetric usually means expensive and usually means there's just one line usually on it. And that one line represents the volume. So if this was a 500 milliliter flask, you usually give it to two decimal places. And when you fill it to the line that you hit 500 milliliters total, it's a very good way to actually make a solution properly. Uh, so usually when you do dilutions, you take maybe a little bit of water, you take obviously the stronger concentrated solution there, you put it in there and then you obviously top it off with some more water carefully and slowly to the line. Uh, put the lid on it, give it a little mix back and forth, and you should have a solution that has a particular molarity depending on what you made there. Uh, if you ever do use a volumetric flask, it's really important to do a couple of things. Uh, 
In this case, this is liquid and liquid recondent mixing. Sometimes you may take a solid and to make a solution or something like that. Uh, but typically what you want to do is be very careful and slow. And you usually want to fill it up like halfway here, kind of cap it and give it some good mixing in the volumetric flask. You don't usually want to bring it to the neck too quickly because you can't really sufficiently mix everything together, especially if you're dealing with perhaps a solid. And then you want to go really, really slow with like your wash bottle here or dropper to make sure you do end up right there at the meniscus. Is it a problem if I go over the meniscus here or the line? Can I just dump out the stuff that's above it? I cannot because technically everything is now dissolved in there, right? The solute is dissolved. So if you decide, which is a very common thing people do, they overshoot the line and go, I'm just going to dump out the stuff above the line, take it back to the line. But what you're dumping out is actually some of your solute. The stuff that's dissolved in there has now just left the flask and you no longer have the correct amount of everybody in there. So that's why it's really important to go slow. Make sure you do stop at that line uh, when you do this dilution. So how do we figure out how much we should use? There is an equation that's commonly used, and this is it. It is M1 times V1 is equal to M2 times V2. Um, this is basically before the dilution, that's molarity and volume. And this is after the dilution, molarity and volume. Usually the guy on the right is the more dilute solution, the twos. The guy on the left there is the more concentrated solution. When you solve for M1, that is the molarity of the concentrated solution. V1 is the volume of the concentrated solution you need to use. M2 is the concentration of the diluted solution. V2 is the total volume of that diluted solution that you're going to make. This is what most people use M1, V1 equals M2, V2 because molarity is the most common unit of concentration. A lot of books and people these days will also use like C1, V1 is equal to C2, V2. And it's basically the same formula. C just stands for generic concentration. So C1 is concentration one times the volume equals concentration two times the volume uh, for that. And again, these two equations are pretty much interchangeable. Again, most of the time, 99% of the time, that's probably the one you're going to use because you are going to use molarity. But technically speaking, you could use any of those other concentration units we talked about earlier. You could do percent by mass on both sides. You could do percent mass to volume on both sides. You know, you could do percent volume to volume on both sides. So that's why some people will use this kind of C1, V1 equals C2, V2. Again, you don't necessarily have to use molarity on both sides, but it is the most common one used. So it is oftentimes used. Uh, again, you could use, like I said, percent mass to mass on both sides or any other legitimate concentration unit on both sides. So uh, <clears throat> let's take a look at one and see what you come up with. What volume of 19 molar sodium hydroxide must be used to prepare one liter of a 0.15 molar uh, sodium hydroxide solution. So take a couple minutes, see what you come up with. Let's take a look here. So just to make sure everybody's on the same page, we basically got a bottle over here. Not sure why it's red, but we got a bottle of red sodium hydroxide, which you never see, uh, that has a concentration of 19 molar. And basically what we're trying to figure out is, you know, how much of it we need to take out to put into a new container, in most cases, that will have a total volume of one liter or 1,000 milliliters, basically. And we'll end up with a concentration of 0.15 molar. So here, we're not really reacting to anything that's sodium hydroxide we're starting with or ending with sodium hydroxide. The only difference here is the molarity is changing, going down, which tells us we're doing a dilution. So that should tell us we could just go into our M1, V1 is equal to M2, V2. Now, in this particular equation, I know earlier I said if you're using sort of volume molarity, the volume should be in liters, and you absolutely could use it in liters here. This is the one place where everything will work out okay if you want to use milliliters in this particular equation. If you're using this equation, you don't necessarily have to convert it to liters, but you can. Uh, but you can also leave it in milliliters. So this is the one place where you can actually leave it in milliliters. And everything will work out okay as long as both volumes here are in milliliters. So, you know, that's one place where you'll sometimes see milliliters used. 
So in this case, uh, the ones here are usually before the dilution. So it's like our more concentrated guy. So this basically will give us 19 molar times V1, which we don't know. Uh, we are shooting for a new concentration of 0.15 molar and one liter, basically. We're going to multiply 0 0.5, 0 0.15 times one, and then we're gonna divide 19 to the other side, basically. Yeah? So we're gonna divide 19 over that way. And that gets us uh, basically 0.15 divided by a 19 gives us a V1 of approximately 0, 0.00, we'll call it 79 liters in this particular case. That is approximately, I'm just gonna convert it into milliliters just because there's less zeros involved. That's 7.9 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide. So what does that number really represent? It represents if you were going to make the solution you would come over to this bottle of 19 molar and you would take out and put in there 7.9 milliliters of the 19 molar into your new container. The rest would essentially be water in this case or the solvent, which in this case, it would be water. Do I then put say 1000 milliliters of water in this case, which is our total volume? You would not want to do that, right? Because if I then put an additional 1,000 milliliters of water in there, my total volume would be 1,007.9 milliliters, which is too much. And my molarity would be incorrect. So a lot of times the dilution problems, they will oftentimes ask you about not necessarily the dilution part, but sometimes they'll ask you about how much water you should put in there. And a lot of times you can figure out the volume of water by simply taking, in most cases, V2 minus V1 is usually a way you could do that. V2 is what we're shooting for, which is a thousand milliliters. V1 is how much of the more concentrated stuff we threw in there. So that tells us that we would need to toss in there. Not that. We would need to add an extra zero and then toss in there. 992.1 milliliters of water would go in there. So the rest of this would be about 992.1 milliliters of water. The 992.1 milliliters of water plus the 7.9 milliliters of this solution gives us a grand total of 1000 milliliters, which is what we're shooting for are basically one liter. When we put the water in, obviously at this point, give it a, uh, I don't know, a mixy mixy shake would be good, but you know, you wanna kind of stir it there, mix it really well. And what you should be left with after you kind of do all the good mixing there is you now should have 1000 milliliters or one liter of a solution that should be a 0.15 molar, the concentration of it. Any questions on any of that? So typically if you solve for V1, a lot of times you're solving for how much of the more concentrated solution you need to use. If you're solving for V2, that again is the total volume of your diluted solution you're trying to make. And if you subtract those two volumes, in a lot of cases, that will tell you how much solvent or water you need to add uh, to it. Any questions on any of that there? Okay, then I want you to try this one here. What volume of water is needed to make uh, 500 milliliters of a 0.25 molar calcium nitrate solution from a five molar solution? Similar situation, no real reaction where you wanna make a calcium nitrate solution from a calcium nitrate solution difference here is the molarities obviously get smaller. So kind of the same situation as what we were just talking about. We got basically a more concentrated bottle of five molar calcium chloride over here. We wanna take a certain amount of that out into a new container, uh, which will have a total volume in this case of 500 milliliters and a molarity of 0.25 molar. So again, we can use our dilution equation here, or M1, V1 equals M2, V2. Uh, M1 and V1, again, being the more concentrated side in most cases, truthfully, it doesn't really matter. You can put it on either side, as long as you keep the numbers together, you know, it doesn't really matter, but uh, we'll go with five molar over here. V1, we don't know, our less concentrated guy that we're shooting for is 0.25 molar. And here uh, we have uh, 500 milliliters over here.
So uh, in this particular case, as I mentioned a sec ago, it is okay in this case to leave it as 500 milliliters, um, right over here, 500 milliliters. You could also, if you wanted to convert it to liters is perfectly fine as well. If you did that, you would end up with obviously 0.5 liters in this particular case. The reason you can leave it in milliliters is when we divide our molarity to this side to solve, the molarity will cancel. And what you'll be left with is milliliters if you use milliliters. If you convert it to liters, you would be left with liters at that point. So again, it depends on what you did there in terms of the volume. So if we do that, V1 would equal uh, 0 0.25 molar times 500 milliliters, just to show you how the milliliters work here. Uh, divided by five molar, molarity on top and bottom cancel, and you're left with milliliters, which is perfectly fine in this situation. And I believe you end up with 25 milliliters here. That is 25 milliliters really of the calcium nitrate solution, the more concentrated calcium nitrate solution. That means that we're going to take out of here 25 milliliters of this guy. But really the question is asking, right, how much water we want. We know that we want a grand total when it's all said and done of 500 milliliters. We obviously just put in there 25 milliliters. So the volume of water in this case would be our total volume minus the volume that we put in there, which means we need also throw in there about 475 milliliters of water in this case. So we need to top it off there with 475 milliliters of water. Again, 475 milliliters of water plus 25 milliliters of the original solution gives us a grand total of 500 milliliters, which is what we're shooting for. And again, if we give it a nice mix and all that, we should then have a concentration that is 0.25 molar in this case. Any question on dilution? Yeah. Okay, question, on, yeah. Actually, this example, based on the question, is actually just looking for the amount of water because that's, I think, what it asked. What is the volume of water needed? So it actually is just looking for the volume of water in this case, which would be the 475 number. So it's important to read the uh, question as well because, again, a lot of times in dilution, it's a very common question that's asked in book problems other places that you do it is really how much water you're adding. And sometimes people really don't read the question. They just like circle that and go, I'm cool, I'm done, right? I put it into the proper formula. But again, in a lot of cases, especially with dilution, water is a very common question of like how much of water you should add or something like that. Other questions? <clears throat> okay, uh, then we're gonna talk about some properties of solutions here. First off, uh, a uh, semi-pyramidal membrane. Uh, is a membrane that basically allows uh, molecules of certain sizes to pass through. Uh, you can't really necessarily see it per se with your naked eye a lot of times, but like in your cells as well, you know, you know, there's kind of like holes and, you know, the holes are, you, some things can fit through the holes, some things basically cannot fit through the holes. So it basically prevents certain things from passing through really based on size. Uh, smaller things have no problem. They can kind of pass back and forth with uh, relatively ease. Um, so it does allow, you know, sort of small solute molecules a lot of times you're using some type of membrane, uh, like a little bag or something you'll maybe use in this week's experiment. Uh, there are certain things that are known as colloids, and colloids are much larger than solute particles in solution. Uh, they are really sort of large molecules like proteins or groups of molecules or ions together. They are a homogeneous mixture, which basically means they look the same throughout, you know, that everything looks the same. Uh, they do not separate or settle out, uh, but they are small enough to pass through filters like filter paper, if you put like on a funnel, a piece of filter paper, uh, but they're too large to pass through these uh, semi pyramidal membranes. So if you go to filter something, with a piece of filter paper up there, your colloid uh, will go through uh, but if you have it in a sort of solution or something with a membrane or inside a sort of membrane like that, uh, it will get kind of stuck in there and really won't pass through uh, those membrane. Suspensions on their hand are heterogeneous uh, mixtures and heterogeneous, right, are things where you look at and you do see different layers, different parts of it. Uh, they're so big, usually you can really see them with your naked eye, you know, you can kind of see the different things. Um, 
and they are very different from solutions or colloids. Um, they are definitely too big and they get trapped everywhere. So, you know, they get trapped on the filter paper. They don't go through the membranes. Very common in experiments. They have you throw sand in there at some point and that's the thing that doesn't go through anything, right? And that would be like your suspension um, in that case. Maybe that's the experiment this week uh, that you might be doing. So, you know, if you go to take something that's, you know, a mixture or solution and you're going to be dumping it through a filter paper and it gets trapped up there on the filter paper, that's definitely your suspension. Obviously, if you dump it through and it goes through the filter paper, maybe as a colloid or a solution uh, that can kind of go through a filter paper. Um, and again, uh, colloids will get kind of trapped there on those membranes. So here's an example of solution colloid or suspension. Again, our suspension or heterogeneous guys, they do settle to the bottom like of a beaker. So if you think of like the sand example, right? If you put sand like in water, you can mix it up all day, but eventually all that sand is just gonna kind of end up on the bottom, right? And that's a suspension. Uh, again, colloids and solutions obviously will float around in the solution part of it. If you go to filter those three, again, through a piece of filter paper, you will find, again, only the colloid and solution being able to pass through the filter paper. Again, as we just talked about, the suspension getting trapped up there on top. And if you put it in like a membrane like a dialysis bag, which I think is this week's experiment. You test what went out of the bag, I think. Is that this week's experiment? Yes, that's right. So you're going to place a whole bunch of things into a bag, and every so many minutes, you're going to test the solution on the outside to see what basically was able to pass through the bag into the solution on the outside. And I think the last thing you do is like pop the bag open and see what's still inside the bag or open the bag and see what's still inside the bag that wasn't able to escape. So here what we see is really with a, a membrane, uh, what you're going to find is the solution, again, is small enough basically to kind of pass back and forth through those uh, holes. And we're going to have our suspension and really our colloids getting kind of trapped uh, inside of the uh, semipyramidal membrane. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Now let's talk a little bit about osmosis. Osmosis is a natural process where solvent molecules kind of move from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration in essentially an effort to dilute down the higher concentration. Like you're way too high over there. I want to send some solvent or water molecules over there. So for example, if you had sort of a a U-shaped container here with a membrane in the middle, a semi-pyramidal membrane. And say on the uh, right-hand side here, we had salt water. And on the left-hand side, we had just regular pure water. The process of osmosis would occur is basically the water molecules over here are less concentrated. For something to be really concentrated it is dependent on how much stuff is dissolved in there, right? So between water and salt water, the salt water has salt or sodium chloride dissolved in it. So it's much more concentrated over there on the right-hand side. So what's going to happen is the natural process that the water molecules on the left will start to flow across the membrane because they're solvent molecules, small enough to pass through the membrane, no problem. They're gonna go to the other side where the salt water is to basically try to dilute it down. It will continue to flow across the membrane until it hits something which is known as the osmotic pressure. And that's basically where atmospheric pressure pushes back down the other way. And it stops basically the flow of solvent molecules across it. So osmotic pressure prevents the additional flow of those water molecules that go across it. Uh, the greater the number of molecules dissolved, the higher the osmotic pressure something has. Um, so for example, a unit known as osmolarity is a unit that is sometimes used to describe osmotic pressure. And that is what is known as sometimes osmol, like that. And it's basically I times the molarity is how you kind of calculate that. I is really the number of particles there are in a solution. So what does that mean? If I have a sodium chloride solution, and let's just say it was two molar, when I tap sodium chloride and it's in solution, does it say together or break apart? It does break apart into a sodium ion and a chloride ion. 
That is a grand total of how many ions? Two, I in this case would be two. That's basically how you figure out I is how many ions you would get in that solution or particles. So if I figured out the osmolarity here of this sodium chloride solution, it would be basically two for I times the two molar gives me basically four osmolarity here. Now, what happens, I took the exact same solution, different solution, but the same concentration, but it was calcium chloride here. That was two molar. When it breaks apart, we get a calcium ion and we get a couple of chloride ions. That's a grand total of how many ions? It is three. I in this case would equal three. Yeah. Now, to figure out the osmolarity here, it would be three times the molarity, which gives me six osmolarity. Six is a larger number than four, right? And this guy would have a higher osmotic pressure because it has a lot more particles dissolved in the solution. So osmotic pressure is a property known as a colligative property, which is all dependent on how much you have dissolved in that solution. And um, the more particles you have in that solution, the more uh, uh, osmotic pressure that you typically have. Pure water has nothing dissolved in it and it actually has no osmotic pressure. So it has nothing dissolved in it, no ions floating around, no particles floating around, rather than water uh, molecules. So it actually has no osmotic pressure. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? Yeah. What's that? Uh, when calcium chloride breaks apart, you get one calcium ion plus two chloride ions. So one plus two gives you three, yep. Other questions? Now, maybe you heard of reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is really this process here up on top, but you apply a external pressure greater than atmospheric pressure. So up up here, you shoot down a much higher pressure than atmospheric pressure. What that's going to do basically is force everybody back the other way. So when you do that, it will essentially force everybody back the other way. You have some good filters in there, right? It'll catch all the junk in there, the solute that you don't want going through, the particles, and it will just send these solvent molecules like the water back to the other side. And you kind of just filtered out your water in that particular example by, just by applying an external pressure greater than basically that atmospheric pressure. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> That's a prettier picture than one I drew, but it's basically the same idea. Let's talk about three ways we can describe solutions. There are isotonic solutions, hypotonic solution, and hypertonic solution. Isotonic solutions have the same osmotic pressure as body fluids. These are typically what our IV solutions are, because if you're getting an IV, you're probably not in good shape. So you don't want to be given something that's going to screw up your cells, I imagine, at that point. Um, so what that means is because there's really the same osmotic pressure on both sides, you get a nice flow if you had something like a red blood cell, the classic example. In an isotonic solution, you have pretty much nice even flow in and out of the V cell, the cell really acting like a membrane, right? Allowing things in and out basically. And you got nice equal flow and everybody is quite happy. What are isotonic solutions? Well, there's basically two. It is a 0.9% mass to volume sodium chloride or saline solution and a 5% glucose solution are typical isotonic solutions. So those are two important numbers. So you have sort of a baseline of what an isotonic solution is. If you have any of those solutions, you're good. Cells are gonna be happy. Cells are not going to be happy if we turn it into a hypotonic solution. Hypo means, hypo means less than. So the solution, say, on the outside of the cell is less concentrated than inside the cell. So in this situation, using our red blood cell as an example, outside of the cell is less concentrated than inside. Osmosis moves from an area of lower concentration to higher concentration. So what's going to happen in this case is the outside is going to go, uh-oh, we need to go and dilute down the red blood cell. 
So all of the outside solution and water is going to rush into the cell. It's going to cause the cell to swell at that point, not a good idea. And eventually it could burst, which is known as hemolysis. So because the outside is less concentrated, osmosis is gonna allow everything to flow into the cell because it's acting like a membrane, just gonna suck up all the water, it's gonna get really big and it sort of burst and explode. And that is hemolysis. What happens on the opposite side of that, which is a hypertonic solution, hyper means more than. So in this case, your red blood cell outside of the cell is more concentrated than inside the cell. So what happens in this particular case is the opposite effect. The cell goes, oh, outside is way concentrated. I need to go dilute that. And what ends up happening is the cell decides all of its inside solution is going to run out of the cell in an effort to dilute out everybody that's out there. The result of that is the cell is going to start to shrink because this is basically dehydrating itself, right? It's kind of shrinking, it's losing all its uh, sort of water, if you will. And what's going to happen in that particular case is it will go start to shrink and go through crenation, which I'm assuming is also not a great idea as well in those type of things. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so here's sort of some pictures, uh, isotonic, nice equal flow, regular donut. Uh, hypotonic, everybody rushes in. Then we get the jelly donut when it explodes. And over here, the hypertonic, uh, we get all the water running out of the cell, the donut hole. These are good things to remember. So let's see if I had a 2% glucose solution. I had a uh, 0.5% sodium chloride solution, a 5% sodium chloride solution, and I had just pure water. If I took a red blood cell, and put it into each of these solutions, what will happen to it? Nothing, will it shrink? Will it swell? Will it burst? Take a second and decide. Okay, so since we're getting down, let's take a look here. So first off, really the two numbers are really important to know is our 0.9% sodium chloride is isotonic and our 5% uh, our glucose is isotonic. So it really is sort of as simple as 2% here is less than, right, five. So less than means hypotonic, right? Hypotonic means that the solution outside the red blood cell is less concentrated than inside. So we are going to get this situation here. Everybody's gonna rush in. This is going to start to swell here and we'll go through hemolysis, right? 0.5% sodium chloride, 0.5% is also less than 0.9, which means less than, this is also going to be a hypotonic solution. Also going to cause everybody to rush in and swell and also cause hemolysis. 5% sodium chloride here, 5% is more than not 0.9%, so more than is hypertonic, which means we're actually gonna get this situation. Outside the cell is more concentrated inside. Everybody's gonna rush out of the cell. The cell is going to shrink and go through crenation here. And pure water, what happens? Is pure water isotonic? Pure water is not isotonic. Pure water has no osmotic pressure, which means it's going to be less than in this case, and it's going to be a hypotonic solution. And that means that you're actually going to have the everybody rushing in, swelling and going through hemolysis. So water, not always the best situation as well to be used in certain situations um because of that obviously if i had a 0.9 percent sodium chloride it would be isotonic and nothing would happen to cell again everything would flow in and out okay the same thing obviously if you had a five percent glucose any questions on any of those there and just the last thing here is dialysis is a process similar to osmosis 
again, it's kind of similar to what you're going to do in the lab this week. You're going to have a kind of really dialysis bag. And uh, dialysis allows, again, certain things to be sort of filtered out and filtered in, right? Like our kidneys and all that good see how it filters out waste products and all those things uh, when we do it. And this is pretty much what you will be doing this week. You'll fill the bag with a bunch of stuff. And again, every so often, basically checking the solution on the outside to see what has escaped. The dialysis bag here, again, has small holes. You can't really see them, but you know, they have really small holes and allow certain size molecules to go through. And then obviously you would punch open the box there or the bag there at the end. A lot of times in laboratories, people use dialysis bags to put things like proteins, for example, in the proper environment, like you would find in your body. You make like a solution at a specific pH, like maybe in your body, you throw your protein in like a dialysis bag, put it in there, protein too big to escape the bag, but allows the environment to flow in there. So now you got your like protein, for example, in the same environment as it would be sort of in nature. So a lot of times it's used in, in that sort of uh, situation, sometimes in labs. Any questions on this? Pretty much wraps up this chapter, I think.